was going to begin by inviting someone in the audience to shoot me <laughs> to protect my human rights. <laughs> but after hearing all the very colorful justifications that the other side could point to for doing that, I thought I'd better not because I might not walk out of here. <laughs> <laughs> so instead, what I'm going to begin with is the origin of human rights. We have to understand that human rights were born of savagery. European savagery. Not slavery, not that savagery. And not colonialism, not that savagery either. Because that savagery was directed towards people who were considered human. So the savagery that gave birth to human rights was the savagery that Europeans committed against Europeans. So the genocidal campaigns that the Germans carried out against leftists, against Jews, against the Roma, against the disabled. Those genocidal campaigns, those gave rise to human rights. But then there was also the bombings of the Allied forces, the massacres, the tens of thousands of people that the Allied forces killed in Dresden, the hundreds of thousands that they killed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those instances of savagery gave rise to human rights. And what was the purpose of human rights? What were the objectives? The objectives were to establish certain norms of human dignity that everyone, all humans, enjoyed, regardless of class, regardless of creed, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of nationalism. So everyone enjoyed human rights, even the people you don't like. <laughs> the objective with human rights was to constrain arbitrary state power because we witnessed what arbitrary state power can cause, the suffering that is willing to rot on people. Now, that was an age of compassion. That was an age of sympathy. That was an age of human solidarity. Now today we live in a different age. Today's objective with human rights <laughs> is to pursue, is to promote universal truths. And we promote these universal truths by unleashing the arbitrary power of the state, by sanctioning, even celebrating, massacres and bombings. If you don't like a government, bomb them. <laughs> if you don't like a leader, assassinate them. If you don't happen to assassinate them during the war, well then, you put together an ad hoc tribunal, <laughs> and if the individual happens to die while in custody, oops. <laughs> if you don't like an individual, well, you ship them to another country and torture them. All in the name of human rights. So the age of compassion has shifted and has given way to the age of the warrior. Now, human rights champions are wearing military fatigues, carrying rifles, guns, rocket launchers. They're manning tanks and fighter jets and leaving in their wake a pool of blood in the name of human rights, in the name of universal truths. But which universal truths are we permitted to kill people to enforce? Whose universal truths? Who can do the killing? Chinese universal truths? China makes up a quarter of the world's population. What about Muslims? Also a quarter of the world's population. Catholics, 1.4 billion? What if China and India were to get together? <laughs> They put forward universal truths, half the world's population. Or maybe universal truths emanate from the Security Council, 15 members. Or perhaps, as was suggested by the other side, by NATO, 28 member states. Or maybe the General Assembly, 191 states, and depending on how things progress in the coming weeks, possibly 192. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of hoping someone would say that. 
Humanitarian intervention is a case of false generosity. It's a falsely charitable act. We're doing good for others. We are helping them. Now, how exactly anyone can think that bombing another country is actually helping these people is beyond me, but that is the claim. It's a complete disregard for sovereign equality, a complete disregard for international law, and a complete disregard for human rights, as was originally envisioned. More importantly to me, what I find is that it shows a stunning contempt for the political and economic imbalances that permeate the world. Does a European country ever have to worry, or will it ever be fortunate enough to benefit from humanitarian intervention? <laughs> no. But African countries do have to think about it, as do Latin American countries, as do Pacific Islands. How many European states would support a democratic United Nations, where decisions are actually made by the whole of this elusive international community? I've had the privilege of learning from students in Sweden, in Canada, in the US, and here in New Zealand. And the vast majority of students in these countries are not in favor of a democratic United Nations. Why? Why do Europeans oppose the idea of a democratic United Nations, European states? Why do many students in New Zealand oppose the idea of a democratic United States? United <laughs> As a Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> Why they are unsupportive? Well, the answer is easy. Because European states know, just as you know, that third world states are not going to vote in favor of bombing themselves. <laughs> so if you support human rights, if you truly support human rights, then you would scoff at humanitarian <coughs> intervention. You would support efforts to redress power imbalances that exist in the world today. You would try to find a way to make the situation between all nations more equitable. Humanitarian intervention is an instance of false generosity. <coughs> Sacrifice is an instance of true generosity. Now where you stand on human rights, or a good way of knowing where you stand on human rights, is by asking yourselves, are you, as members of a first world state, members who enjoy all the privileges of being citizens of a first world state, prepared to sacrifice some of the political power that first world states acquired through a rather bloody and savage history. 